Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next session of the Writer's Digest Conference 2020. My name is Michael Loran. I am thrilled to be here, thrilled to have you with me. And I hope that the next 45 minutes to an hour will be a fun time for all of us because I know there's some folks from California, some folks from all over the all over the world here. And I know there's some of you who are probably uh, just loading up on your coffee. <laughs> so I will try to make this worth your while. The name of this session is Be a Writing Machine. Write faster and smarter, beat writer's block, and be prolific. And we're going to talk about what that means and how you can do it. And I just wanted to, to give a couple of housekeeping things. I know that some of you are going to be joining as this is going on. So I have an assistant, Rayla, who is in the background. You can't see her, but she will be taking your questions. So I, I, I love to see all the activity in the chat. Be sure to uh, let me know how you're enjoying this talk. That would be great for me. But if you have any questions, be sure to use the question feature. And then Rayla will get those off to me at the end of our talk today. And I will be sure to answer any and all questions that, that you may have throughout the talk. I want to make sure that uh, we, we take some time to do that. All right. So what is the benefit of this talk today? What is it that you are going to be learning? What is it that uh, I want you to take away from the talk today? And honestly, the benefit is what's up on the screen, how to write faster and smarter, beat writer's block, and be prolific. That is how I have learned to become a writing machine. So let's, let's talk a little bit about me and why I am qualified to give this talk because you're probably thinking, who is this Michael Loran guy? Why is he talking about being a writing machine? I, I want some I want some facts. I want some credibility here. <laughs> so I, I consider myself to be a man of many titles. First and foremost, I'm a dad, father. I am a YouTuber. So I run a successful YouTube channel called Author Level Up. And you can find that at youtube.com slash author level up if you're interested. We're 30,000 subscribers and growing. And it's a, I have an amazing community. And I talk about writing and writing craft videos. So 30,000 subscribers. And I also call myself a purveyor of adventure. So first and foremost, which is the reason why I'm qualified to talk about this at all, is that I am a self-published author of over 50 books of science fiction and fantasy and self-help for writers. So I don't just give writing advice. I am first and foremost a writer and I write books. And just a few weeks ago, I started on book number 55. So that is one reason I'm qualified to give a talk about being a writing machine. And the second title I like to call myself is I would call myself a professional juggler, <laughs> not of balls, but of components of my career. So I have built a successful writing career for myself while raising a family. So I have a rambunctious six-year-old daughter who is amazing and probably a future writer in training. I don't know yet. We're working on that. <laughs> I have a beautiful wife. I've got a puppy and I've got a pet rabbit. So as you can imagine, I'm being pulled in many, many different directions every single day. And I also work full-time in the insurance industry. So I'm not a full-time writer yet. In many respects, I'm still walking the path to become a full-time writer. And I work in the insurance industry and I work long hours and it is a pretty demanding job. And I've still managed to build a writing career in spite of that. And I'm also, if that wasn't enough, in law school classes in the evenings. So I've managed to do all of that stuff and continue to write a lot of books. And if you look at me on paper, I would be probably candidate number one of someone who should not be a writer simply because of all the things that I have going on in my life. But I've managed to do it and I've managed to do it pretty well and be really productive. And so that's what I want to share with you today. Some things that have made me successful and productive. And I hope that there'll be some things that, that we can learn from. All right. So. First and foremost, I wanted to, to talk about a few of my books, just put a few of my book covers up here uh, to show you some of my fiction. So these are a couple series that uh, are, are pretty popular for me right now. I've got one series called The Good Necromancer that's currently in progress. That is about an ex-necromancer 
who became a necromancer and, and got himself in some really, really bad stuff and got out of the game and has to get back into it in order to save an old friend. And uh, that's a fun series because it takes place in my hometown of St. Louis, 314 represent. And yeah, I really enjoy that one. And then I've got probably uh, on the screen, probably my most famous series or my most popular series, and that's The Last Dragon Lord. And that's a series about a bloodthirsty dragon lord who is pursuing revenge against the conspiracy that overthrew him. So I like to describe my dragon anti-hero as uh, one part smog from Lord of the Rings, one part Richard III from Shakespeare, and one part uh, Francis Underwood from House of Cards. So if you like bloodthirsty anti-heroes, uh, that, that's a pretty popular series, especially in audio. And I've also got some self-help books for writers. So I, I, I like to write books for writers because I like to kind of codify my thoughts and try to help writers become better versions of themselves. And so I've got a few books down here. That's not all of them. But the one I, I would like to talk about today is Be a Writing Machine, because much of what I'm going to cover today is from that book. And so I wanted to just uh, put the cover of the book on here. This for me in many ways was the book that started it all for me. And I, I wrote this book without thinking that it would be successful at all. And it was more successful than I ever imagined. And um, we're gonna be talking a lot about the theories and the concepts from this book. And I just want to let you all know that it is available wherever you get your books at authorlevelup.com slash machine. And it's available in ebook, paperback, and audio. All right, so I'll repeat that link throughout the, the talk today. So how do we become a writing machine? Well, there are four things that we're gonna talk about today. Four important things that for me have been game changers in terms of how I write books, how I write books consistently day in and day out, and how I just have, I just love this industry. And the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to have to talk about doing the emotional work. And we need to talk about conquering your fears and talk about the emotional challenge of being a writer, because that is something that is not talked about enough. Second thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about mastering the tools that we use. Just as any, any artisan contractor has to master the tools that they use when they're doing construction or renovation, so too do we need to master the tools of writing, specifically mastering our writing app. And we're going to talk about what that means and why it is so important that your writing app must be an extension of your fingers. And then we're going to talk about how to restructure your time. I know a lot of people struggle with time management. A lot of people struggle with finding the time to write. And so I'm going to offer some ideas for you, for you to help you think about that differently. And we're going to talk about the three things that you can do to time. There's only three things. You can add time, edit time, and delete time. So we're going to cover that. And lastly, we're going to cover the bugbear that every writer struggles with, and that is writer's block and how it is an ever morphing foe. And I'm going to give you some tools and weapons to win the war against that foe. So that's that's going to be the, the, the structure of our talk today and how we become writing machines. All right. So first things first, we need to talk about the emotional challenges of being a writer. And I like to ask this question. I like to start a lot of talks with this one question, because I think that this one question is the most important question that you need to know the answer to. And I, 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 don't, I don't like to use prescriptives, folks. I don't like to say you need to or you should. At least I don't do it on purpose. Every, every writer is different. Every writer has their own paths. And follow your path. Don't take people's advice wholesale. But I believe very thoroughly with, with all of my soul and being that the most important question every writer is going to have to answer at some point in their career is what's your why? Why are you a writer? And it seems like an easy question, but it's often one that we tend to run away from, at least I have found. Now, let me tell you a story. And, we're, and I got to give you a fair warning. We're going to go from zero to deep in about 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> Just a fair warning. But I have two reasons on why I am a writer. Two reasons that set my soul on fire. And what I want for you is to have that answer that sets your soul on fire 
on why you are a writer. First reason I'm a writer. The year was 2012. I was on a beautiful dinner with my wife and we had a great night out on the town. We went downtown and had just this really cool dinner. And I got home later that night and I fell ill with what I thought was food poisoning. And I went to the hospital and lo and behold, I didn't leave the hospital for a month. And I'll spare you folks the gastrointestinal details because you don't you didn't come here for that. But while I was in the hospital, I, I caught another infection and the doctors couldn't figure out what it was. And quite frankly, it was uh, pretty close to medical malpractice. Um, but eventually the doctors found it out. But I was very, very close to not being here with you today. And I remember being in the hospital. And at that point in my life, it was a, a complicated time because I was working a dead end job in the insurance industry. It just worked a job I absolutely hated. Student loans were half my paycheck. I, I wanted to be a writer, but in many respects, I was a sometime writer. I, I kind of had written some short stories or written some poems. I tried to shop a, shop a manuscript off to agents and, and, and editors, but no one would even look at anything that I wrote, mainly because it, it was pretty bad. <laughs> but there was just so many things that weren't happening for me in my life at that point. And I remember being on morphine and having these crazy hallucinations. And I remember staring at the wall and, and in a moment of clarity, I had to ask myself, what am I doing with my life? How did I get here? And I don't remember what it was, but I blame the drugs that I had this beautiful vision of me becoming a writer, uh, of me sitting in front of this stack of books that I had written in it. And I remember that that vision just making me so happy. And I remember on that hospital bed, I swore on that bed that I would become a writer and no matter what, and that I would bend the universe around me to make that happen. And fortunately, I got better. I healed and I jumped into self-publishing. And for me, every time I think about my why as a writer, I think about that moment at my lowest on that hospital bed. And that's what keeps me going because I found my calling. I found my gift and I can use that gift to impact the lives of other people. How cool is that? Second reason I'm a writer. My mo mother and father, biological mother and father, separated when I was young and I never got to know my biological father. And I will confess to you that I carried around these feelings of resentment and anger at my father for never being there. And when I got older and I had a family of my own, that anger and resentment turned into just curiosity. I, I, I wasn't angry anymore. I just wanted to know. I just wanted to understand. And so I reached out to my father and found him on Facebook. Yay, the technology, right? And I found him and he, he didn't, I sent him a message and said, Hey, I'm your son. I'd like to, to connect with you and, and, and just chat. And he didn't respond. He didn't want anything to do with me. And for a long time, I wasn't okay. I, I, I just, I, I really struggled with it. And the one thing that got me out of that was writing. I sat down to write a little book that just talked about my philosophies on writing. And it was part autobiographical, part process and part how to be productive. And for me, that was my way of articulating the problem I was dealing with and wrestling with it. And that helped me. And that book became the book that is the subject of this talk today, which is Be a Writing Machine. So those are the two things that set my soul on fire. One, I'm a writer because I'm not going to waste any more of my life again trying to figure out what my calling is. Two, I'm a writer because writing is how I deal with the emotional problems that I'm dealing with in my life. And I know that when people read, that is how they deal with the emotional problems that they have. And so it's this beautiful helping the world with your writing is, is how I see things. Now, folks, I'm not asking you to have a near-death experience or to have a family fall out to figure out what sets your soul on fire, but I am asking to figure out what it is that sets you on fire. Because when you are stuck in the middle of a manuscript at 2 a.m. and you're staring at a blank cursor, when you know your why, it's a lot easier to get through it. And that is why I say that the biggest challenges that a writer faces are emotional. 
you know, there's there's problems that you're going to deal with, things that you're going to have to learn. You have to learn writing craft. That's why you're at the Writer's Digest conference. You've got to learn marketing. You've got to learn business. You've got to learn copyright and all these things. But all those things can be learned. There's no, there's never any doubt that you're going to learn those things. It just takes time, patience, blood, sweat, tears, a little bit of alcohol, and some elbow grease. That's that's all it takes. But the bigger challenges you're going to have to face as a writer are all emotional. And the things that I'm talking about here are the things that I have on the screen. Comparisonitis, imposter syndrome, self-doubt, the inferiority complex, anxiety. These are all things that we have to deal with as writers, and they're going to become more and more difficult to deal with the more you progress in your career. And I just want you to know that if you can overcome the emotional part of being a writer, then it's going to be a lot easier to deal with anything else that comes up in your life. I'm telling you this, it, you get past the emotional problems, you adjust your mindset, anything is possible. Now, I don't want you to take away that uh, writing is, you know, I, I'm telling you mindset and uh, you change your mindset and automatically you're going to be successful. No, I don't want you to take that away. What I want you to take away is the fact that if you change your mindset about what is possible for you to achieve, then things start changing. All right. Now, that's the emotional piece. That's the first part about being a writing machine. And I had to I had to go deep. We're going to come up a little bit. <laughs> we're, we went down to the bottom of the lake right, right at the beginning of the morning. Now we're going to come up a little bit. And we want to talk about the second part of being a writing machine. And that is picking the right tool. You know, I, I talked about being a contractor and how contractors are masters of their tools. Accountants are masters of QuickBooks. Well, we need to be masters of our writing apps. And I'm here to offer a suggestion. If you use Microsoft Word or, heaven forbid, OpenOffice, and you spend, let's say you have an hour worth of writing time, right? And during that writing time, you're spending 20 minutes every time trying to fix problems that Word is creating, because we all know Word thinks it's smarter than us a lot of the times. And we're trying to fix those formatting problems, all right? That is taking time away from our writing. It's making us less productive. So why spend your time doing that? There are dozens and dozens of writing apps out there, and many of them are, are, are great, and they're all different and great in their own right. Why not pick a writing app that works really well for you, figure that out, and then learn how to master it, right? Because if you can master your tool, instead of spending 20 minutes of every hour fighting formatting problems, you're spending an hour out of every hour writing and writing, and you're more productive automatically. So I'll tell you folks, I have to confess, I'm biased. I'm an extremely biased guy because Scrivener is my writing app of choice. Can I get an amen for Scrivener in the chat for those of you who use Scrivener? I, I, I I, we got to show Scrivener some love, okay? That's the app I use. I love it because it allows me to be more productive. It allows me to be a better version of myself. And I, when I when I learned that Scrivener was the tool for me, I wanted Scrivener to fit me like a glove so that it became an extension of my fingers. And so I invested in every book I could find from Scrivener, every course, every premium course. And in a period of about 60 days, I became a master at Scrivener so that when I sit down, my writing session is as optimal as it can be. But let me take this a step further in how I made this work for me. So my lifestyle is quite busy. I'm always on the go. I'm always on the run. I only spend maybe about an hour in front of my computer every day. And so I was finding that if I don't change some things, I'm really not going to be able to continue <laughs> publishing at the pace that I want to publish. And so Scrivener has a great iOS feature. And what that feature allows you to do, it allows you to write on your phone and sync it with your desktop. So let me tell you some, some examples of how I've written novels on my phone. So when I'm standing in line at the grocery store and it's a long line, I pull out my phone and I write a few sentences. I don't check Facebook anymore. I don't check Twitter anymore. I don't check my email anymore. I've reconditioned my mind to write just one or two sentences. That's all. 
I've written parts of my novel while waiting at the doctor's office to be seen. All right. I have, I've written parts of my novel in the back seat of an Uber car while on a plane. I've been able to do all of these things and that has helped improve my writing word count by 40%. So I write 40% more by incorporating the phone into my workflow. Now I'm not asking you to do that, but isn't it interesting when you pick the right tool, how everything just falls into place? So I want you to spend time thinking about that and how that works. All right. And there is a link to Scrivener in the chat for any of you who are interested. They do offer a free trial. Phenomenal. All right. That's the second part of being a writing machine, folks. So the third thing we need to talk about is time. So we need to talk about restructuring our time. And as I alluded to, there are only three things that you can do with time. You can delete time. So I have a gentleman here on the screen who's playing some video games. <laughs> I'm not ripping on video games. I'm a video game fan myself. But are you? How much time are you spending not writing? You know, instead of instead of trying to find writing time, what are you doing throughout the day that that is that is wasting time? And might it might I suggest that maybe spend less time writing video game, playing video games, less time watching Netflix, less time doing other things that are taking writing time away. And that can be much, much, much better, okay? There's a lot of things that you can do, all right? And so I, I think that that is really, really important. Now, if you ever meet me in person, you will find that I, I kind of have an intense personality. I'm very singularly focused on writing. Uh, I, I'm very strict in terms of how I spend my time. I'm not asking you folks to do that, but, but I bet that there are 10 to 15 minute increments here and there that you can find to squeeze in more writing time. Now, the second thing we can do with our time is we can edit our time. All right, editing time is very, very important. All right, let's see here. Oh, okay, well, my uh, slides got a little ahead of me, folks. Sorry about that. All right, so we can edit our time, okay? So if you're spending 30 minutes every day writing, can you, can you edit that and optimize it to 35 minutes or 40 minutes? People think that they have to find these gigantic blocks of time, right? These gigantic blocks of time. And it, it's, it's really not, um, that's not practical, especially if you are a parent or if you are, um, you're taking care of uh, aging parents or, or loved ones. It's just not realistic. You're waiting for writing time that's never going to come. I talk to people all the time that say, "I want to write. Uh, I want to write on a Saturday, where I've got four hours of uninterrupted writing time." That's just not practical. It's just not practical. It's easier to find time to write in ten to fifteen minute increments, thirty minute increments, an hour increment, because that's more that's more realistic. All right. So if you can do those things that makes life a lot easier. Okay. So we can edit our time. All right. So the third thing, this is a picture in my, uh, and it's a picture from my house here. <laughs> so around, uh, around, uh, it was like Thanksgiving or Black Friday of last year. I, uh, I got my wife a gift and it was really cool because, um, I spend a lot of time vacuuming. I, I spend a lot of time vacuuming. It's like 30, 45 minutes every weekend vacuuming. And <laughs> I, got, I, I got my wife this gift. So folks, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell my wife this. Okay. I got her this little robo vacuum and I, and, and the thing comes on at midnight every night and it vacuums my entire house. So I don't have to spend that 30 to 40 minutes vacuuming except like once a month. Now I got her here, honey, here's the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> but I was able to spend that third extra 30 to 45 minutes writing and spending more time writing. Now she probably knows this, but, <laughs> but I, that's, that's another example of how you can use, um, you can use technology or you can use things to help you reclaim some of that writing time. Another example of this is maybe you're working on a novel one summer and you have to mow your lawn and, you know, summertime is a, a you got to spend a lot of time in your lawn. At least I do. You know, what if you hire some neighbor, neighbor kid, you know, who wants to make a little bit of money on the side, 
you know, pay them, you know, once or twice a month to mow your lawn and then spend that time that they're mowing, they're mowing your lawn, spend that time writing, you know? So it really is that simple. When you start thinking about writing and, and your time as an adventure and a way to spend more time doing what you love doing, then a lot of things become possible. All right. So the, the last thing we got to have a talk, folks, we got to have a talk about writer's block. All right. Now, writer's block is very, very important, and it is one of the most difficult challenges you're going to have to deal with as a writer. And I apologize. I'm having some issues here. Everything is good, but uh, my phone decided to keep going off here. So I'm so sorry about that, folks. Writer's block is very, very important because it is one of the more one of the more prominent issues you're going to have to deal with. Now, I talked earlier about emotional struggles and emotional challenges. Writer's block is one of those ugly things that just keeps rearing its ugly head over and over and over. And just when you think you've beaten it, it comes back. And it comes back in a different way. All right. Now, we're going to talk about this because this is the one I want you to take this away because when I learned this, everything changed for me. All right. Now I'm here to tell you that when you think about writer's block, don't think of it so much as a war with yourself. That's what people like to think of it as. Oh, I, I'm, 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 I'm at battle with my writer's block and you know, it, you grind all these gears and it, it's difficult, but it's actually not that at all. The, the root cause of writer's block is actually very simple. And when you understand that writer's block is really just a pattern and there's a tool that you can use to, to, to defeat it, it makes it a lot easier. So there are only three root causes of writer's block. The first root cause is fear. The second root cause is lack of creativity. The third root cause is personal circumstances. And we're going to talk about each of those. So let's talk about fear. Fear drives so much writer's block, it's crazy. Now, there is a difference between fear and anxiety, and it's important to understand that difference. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Gavin De Becker. He was Oprah's top security consultant. So he was responsible for protecting Oprah for many years, and uh, now he protects Jeff Bezos. So he knows what he's talking about when it, it comes to protecting people. And one of the things that he's really good at is identifying threats. And there's a YouTube talk that he gave years ago at a college, and he talked about the difference between fear and anxiety. So let's talk about fear. So he talks about this story about a, a guy who's surfing in the ocean, and all of a sudden, he sees this great white shark coming up out of the water at him. And then the next thing he knows, he's in the jaws of this great white shark. I mean, can you imagine that? So what the gentleman reported is that time started to slow down for him. And he didn't know why he got this idea, but he took his, his thumbs and he reached around the shark and he jammed them in the shark's eyes. And he said that they, the eyes broke like eggs. And the shark started swimming down toward the ocean floor. And the guy said, you know, something, I, I sh probably should have let go of the shark at this point because it probably would have let me go, but I didn't. And so he went down with the shark all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And then the shark finally let him go and he swam up to safety. And people asked him to this day, why, why did you do that? Why did you hold on to the shark? And he said, I don't know. It, it was, it was my, my brain that, that told me to do that. That is fear. Fear makes you do things that you didn't think you could do in an effort to save your life. Fear is a result of an imminent threat in your immediate environment that is trying to harm you. Now let's contrast that with anxiety. You're sitting in front of your computer, staring at a blank cursor, worried about what people are going to think about what you're, what you're writing. You're afraid that they're going to give you a one star. You're maybe afraid that no one's going to buy your book. You're maybe afraid that if you publish a book, people are going to come to your house with a, with a mob and, and pitchforks and, and decry that your career is over. <laughs> that, that, it doesn't work that way. All right. But it's easy to think that when you have those emotions staring in front of the blank cursor, that it's the same as fear because our minds are conditioned that way. 
So stop being afraid of things that you imagine, because it's just as possible that when you publish that book, there's going to be someone out there who absolutely loves it and sends you a thank you note for writing it. So we get so scared of all these realities that we think are going to pass that are negative, And we forget that it's just as possible that the reality could be a good one. All right. So I'm here today to stop, to tell you to stop being afraid of things that you imagine. Now, if you're writing and staring at a blank cursor and a tiger busts through your window and is threatening to eat you, before you die, I want you to send me an email and say, Michael, you were wrong. <laughs> but until that happens, it, it's, it, it's all in your mind. It, it's all anxiety. Don't let anxiety ruin your life. And when you, when you start ignoring the fear, you'll find that the writer's block goes away. Second thing, the second root cause of writer's block is lack of creativity. All right. So I have a picture of a well here because I think it's pretty symbolic. We, we always talk about our creative wells, right? And th the easiest cause of writer's block is probably just because you need to consume more content. I know sometimes when, uh, when, I, when I'm writing, I, sometimes the words aren't flowing because I, I, my, my creative well has dried up. There was one time I was writing a novel and I just could not get the words on the page. And so I, I put the novel aside for a day or two. And one night my wife and I went to this bakery. We'd never been there before. It was kind of like a, like a hipster bakery uh, in a hot part of town. And we went there and the moment I walked in, I just, it was like sensory overload. I was just having all of these really cool ideas. And there were just so many really interesting things happening, so many interesting people. And I remember being so inspired and I went back to the, to the novel that I was working on and Lo and behold, that bakery was exactly what I needed. I ended up writing a, a bakery that was very similar into the novel, and that ended up being readers' favorite part of the book. So sometimes you just need to get away from your regular routine, read more books, watch more movies, go on a, go on a date with yourself, and experience new things, and you'll find that writer's block will go away. And if you continue to do that on a regular basis, you can inoculate yourself against this type of writer's block. Because if you're always exposing yourself to new things that are inspiring you, it's, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have to deal with this that often. That's the second root cause. Third root cause is one we need to spend some time on, and that is personal circumstances. So things happen, right? I mean, we, we have uh, loved ones that maybe fall ill with, with illnesses or heaven forbid, pass away. We ourselves may get illnesses or have to deal with extreme personal circumstances. Uh, there's, there's loss of a job, especially now. I mean, there's all sorts of things that life can throw our way and, and, it, and it can knock us down. And it's okay to lay down on the mat for a minute and just get your bearings straight. And sometimes what can happen is that we will try to write and our subconscious will stop us from writing because it knows that there are other things we need to be dealing with. And what I found is when you go and deal with the problems that you need to deal with, you deal with the personal circumstances, you'll find that the writer's block magically goes away. So let me give you an example. Just this past month, it's a simple example, but just this past month, my, my wife and I, we went to St. Louis, my hometown, to visit some relatives that we hadn't seen since the pandemic began. And normally on, on a vacation, I try to write a little bit, you know, I write on my phone, but our senses were so heightened because we were so worried about, you know, not catching the virus and making sure we were safe and disinfecting everything and figuring out how we were going to get from point A to point B that I just couldn't make it happen. I just couldn't get anything written. But the moment I got home, and everything was safe and we were all fine. The, the words flowed. It was like turning on, uh, turning on tap, tap water. <laughs> it just started flowing. So sometimes your brain has this really beautiful way of stopping you from writing because there are other things that you need to handle. And sometimes that can be the cause of your writer's block. So deal with the problems you need to deal with and it'll go away. So I want you to think about writer's block as a lock next time you deal with it. And now that we've talked about the keys to unlock it, I want you to ask yourself, is the writer's block I'm dealing with coming from fear? If it is, keep pushing through. Is it coming from lack of creativity? If it is, get yourself into a new environment. 
or is it coming from personal circumstances? And if it is, handle those personal circumstances. And I hope that you'll find that you'll be able to defeat your writer's block more often than not. All right. So to recap, folks, it's hard to believe that we're already at the recap. All right. Now to recap, writing is about mindset. If you want to become a writing machine, write faster and smarter, beat writer's block, and be prolific, it is about mindset. Change your mindset, you change your life. I'm a big believer in uh, Mel Robbins. She's a motivational speaker. And she has a saying that you're one decision away from a completely different life. Now, while that's a bit exaggerated, you are always one decision away from a completely different writing life. And the decisions you make every single day will lead you down paths that you, you never knew you could, you could accomplish. Now, second, we talked about mastering your writing tool so that the writing tool can be an extension of your fingers so that you're maximizing your writing time. We also talked about optimizing your schedule for maximum momentum because your schedule is so important and there's always things you can do to restructure your time to find more time for your art. And lastly, we talked about how writer's block always has a root cause and it is your job to find it. You find the root cause, you'll find that you can severely minimize the impact of writer's block in your life. And the motivational speaker I mentioned is Mel Robbins, M-E-L, uh, Mel Robbins. That's, that's her full name. I know someone had mentioned that. All right. So I did just want to give a final plug for uh, the book, Be a Writing Machine. If you liked what you heard today and, and there were some things that resonated with you, I know that you'll love the book. And there's tips in there on how to write faster and smarter. And the, probably the most popular section of the book is the section on writer's block because I give you 26 strategies to defeat writer's block. So we talked about the three root causes, but I actually give you some strategies to, to beat fear. I give you some strategies to beat the lack of creativity, and I give you some strategies to beat personal circumstances as well. So you can get your copy of the book if you're interested at authorlevelup.com slash machine. And again, it's available in ebook, paperback, and audio. And I, I would love to continue the conversation with all of you. And um, I just wanted to give a couple of shout outs of what some folks have said about this. Uh, one person says, this is the book for you if you want to learn how to stand up to your fears and push through. This is the book for you if you need a slap in the face about how much time you're wasting not writing your book. <laughs> and a second person said, I specifically like the author's candidness on fear uh, and techniques to conquer it and definitely going to try a few of his suggestions. And uh, I will tell you that I've got a YouTube audience of 30,000 people. And many of them have uh, tried a lot of the strategies in the book to great success. So you can get your copy again at authorlevelup.com slash machine. And folks, we're, it's crazy. We're, we're at the end of the line where we're going to take some questions. But I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for investing in your career and your knowledge. Thank you for supporting Writer's Digest. I also want to thank the folks at Writer's Digest for an amazing time this morning. Everything just flows really smoothly. They always take really good care of me when I come to these events. So I want to thank Amy, the, the editor-in-chief, for extending the invitation. Also thank Taylor and, and the Writer's Digest team and the folks at Entrado uh, for making this happen. So if you'd like to continue the conversation with me, I would love to continue that. You can find my fiction at the links on the screen here. MichaelLaron.com is where you can find my novels. And if you're interested in my YouTube channel and my books for writers and all the other things I got going on. You can find me at authorlevelup.com and feel free to, to shout me out on Twitter and let me know you were here today. That would be fantastic. So with that, folks, I would love to answer your questions. So um, we're going to transition over into a Q&A here. All right. And um, thank you to Rayla for, for queuing up the questions here. All right. So the first question comes from Katie Bennett. I love how you were saying, are you really strict with your time with writing? Do you block out time where you make sure you aren't writing, such as family time? I think I'm curious about how you maintain work-life balance between writing, family, and work. Oh, that's such a great question, Katie. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I try to find time to write when my family is asleep. <laughs> like right now, uh, my, my, my wife and daughter tend to be late sleepers. So I tend to wake up about 530 during the week 
five 30 in the morning. And that, that's a great time for me to write and get things done because I know that they're not going to be awake and I'm not really going to be interrupted. And then when they go to sleep, I will usually spend some time between, you know, 10 and, you know, maybe nine, 10 30, getting some more writing in. But yeah, when I'm with my family, I'm with my family, you know, when I'm done with work, uh, we have family time. We, you know, when, when the weather's nice, we spend time um, watching movies or going on walks and all that. And I don't miss that for the world. So the answer is the short answer is having your spouse on board makes all the difference in the world. Because uh, if you don't have your spouse on board, it makes it a lot harder. <laughs> but like right now I'm, I'm do, giving this talk. And then at, right after this, I'm, I'm doing a live stream on my YouTube channel. And I know that about 1230, when I go upstairs, my wife is going to say, here's the daughter, here's the puppy, here's the rabbit, have fun, I'll see you in a few hours. <laughs> so it's, it's a love language, that's kind of how it goes. Great question. All right, next question comes from Sandra. Um, recently, I was introduced to the concept of imposter writers and it blew my mind. Now it haunts me constantly while I, while I write. How does one get rid of that? Yeah, that's a great question, Sandra. Um, I've always said that Imposter syndrome is an imposter. You know, when, when you're feeling like you're an imposter, that's actually, might that actually be a good thing? Because if you're, if you're feeling like you're an imposter, that actually inspires you to be better. Just try to cut out the negative feelings. You know, it's okay to feel like you need to learn more. It's okay to feel like you're, you've got so much more to, to learn. It's okay to feel like maybe you're, you're not as good as other folks out there, but the key is to keep sitting down, you know, keep sitting down because remember, remember that difference between fear and anxiety. And what I fear with some folks is that they think about the imposter syndrome and then they get stuck in the theater of their own minds. Right. So just keep at it. You'll find that uh, the imposter changes its words to try to get you to believe it. So it's never going to go away. Um, I myself deal with it. But I have also found that if I keep sitting down in the chair, the voice gets quieter and it's a lot easier to ignore when it's quieter. All right. All right. Uh, Katie asked another question. I've heard some people say writer's block doesn't exist and people just have to show up to do the work anyway. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I've got, I've kind of got this uh, stick in the book, Katie, where I say that uh, I, I use writer's block in quotations because <laughs> I don't really believe it exists either. But, you know, there's something to be said about it. Um, I, I, I do believe just sitting down and doing the work is very important. And at the end of the day, if you keep pushing, the writer's block goes away. You know, I, I really haven't had a, a, a true bout of writer's block since 2015. You know, so a lot of it's emotional, a lot of it's, it's mindset, change your mindset, change everything. All right. Next question comes from Renee. What other tool, what other tips do you have to quiet the anxiety when staring at a blinking cursor? Yeah, there's a, a, a great, a great tip I'll give you. Uh, and it's also in the book, Renee, uh, it has to do with U S Navy SEALs. So the, the United States Navy SEALs are some of the, 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 the toughest folks you can imagine. And they go through uh, incredible training to, to do what they do on a daily basis. And the dropout rate is extraordinary. And one of the things that they teach them in, in Navy SEALs training is this concept of micro focus. So instead of focusing on getting through training, they focus instead, you know, and you're in the middle of a thunderstorm and you're crawling in the mud under barbed wire fences, focus on moving your arm. You know, don't, don't worry about the training. Focus on moving your arm, because if you move your arm, you can move your other arm. You move your other arm, you can move your torso. You move your torso, you can you can shimmy your legs, and eventually you'll get on the other side of, of the obstacle you're dealing with. It's the same thing with a novel. You know, don't focus on the novel itself. Don't focus on the war. Focus on the battle. Focus on the very next sentence that you can write, and sometimes focus on the next word. Because if you can if you can write the next word, you can write the next sentence. Write the next sentence, write the next paragraph. That's the number one thing uh, that I, I, I have learned personally, that it is a challenge. But that's, that's one thing that I would try to focus on is don't focus on the end result. Focus on the process. All right. All right. Got some Scrivener love here. That's fantastic. Uh, Lena asks, what's the difference between Scrivener and Word? Ah, uh, Lena, that is a a question that could be a, a, a talk in and of itself. But the main difference is that Scrivener 
is built for writers. Microsoft Word is a generic tool. Anyone can use Word for any number of purposes. Uh, Scrivener is built for writers by writers. And the, the benefit of it is that you're going to get tools that are going to specifically help you write your novel, whereas Word is really not going to give you uh, that level of support. All right, Anne asks, I'm curious how Scrivener can help me write magazine articles and shorter nonfiction pieces. Yeah, Anne, it can absolutely help you do that. That That's probably outside of the scope of this talk. Um, but definitely, definitely look up uh, a lot of Scrivener tutorials on YouTube. I've got one actually, it's called Learn Scrivener in 20 Minutes. I think if you type in Learn Scrivener, my video is like the number one video that will show up. So you, you kind of can't miss it on YouTube. <laughs> but check it out and, and watch some of the videos. And I think you'll see uh, you'll see some of the uh, some of the things that you can start applying to to your magazine articles and your uh, blogs. All right, and our uh, final question comes from Ramona. I write personal essays, which often take me into difficult emotional territory. What are your suggestions for recovering from a draining writing session? That's a very insightful question. I would say, Ramona, uh, to take care of yourself uh, emotionally. Um, one of the things that I, I I've started doing over the past two years, and this was this was a result of uh, having the experience with my father. Uh, I started going to therapy, you know, not because I, I not because I mean, there's anything like I'm not like it, it, it's one of those things. People, when you think you go to therapy, they think, oh my gosh, there's something really really wrong, and that's not true. Um, it, it's it's great to be able to just talk to somebody about the problems you're dealing with in a, a non-judgmental way. And so maybe that could help. Um, also, maybe taking some time to do meditation, um, yoga, those sorts of things, just finding some ways to, to help yourself uh, drain a lot of that negative energy. Because sometimes with the writing, when you're writing about these things, um, I, I kind of know what you're talking about with the difficult emotional territory. You almost have to purge yourself of that uh, before you start writing and then after. So another great thing that works for me is just getting away from the computer and just focusing on, on writing, uh, not writing, but like taking a long walk or something. You know, it's something I like to do. I got, got a puppy. So it gives me some exercise. I'll, I'll go grab her and we'll, we'll go on a walk and we'll take an extra long walk. And, and those are, those are some simple, but free things that you can do to help you with that. And, um, the, the important thing is to don't stop doing the work just because it's draining. Um, that probably means it's really important, th the type of work that you're doing. And so uh, don't let don't let the end result of your writing session stop you from your next writing session. So. All right. And I'll give it another a moment here for any questions that you folks have. I, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I have greatly appreciated your time. So I'll give it uh, about 30 seconds to see if there's any more folks that have questions. Okay, I, I saw someone in the chat that says now they want to know about the puppy. <laughs> She's the teddy bear. She's uh uh, a Bichon and Shih Tzu mix. So she, we like to call her the Tasmanian devil because uh, she gets into these, these, uh, these bursts of energy and she just runs around the house and uh, kind of goes crazy. It's kind of fun to watch. So anyway, it looks like those are all the questions, folks. I want to thank you again for your time today. It has been phenomenal. And uh, I would love to continue the conversation with many of you if you're interested in connecting with me offline. So enjoy the rest of the Writer's Digest conference. And I hope that you have an amazing weekend.